We've all watched at least a few of these shows, and we've probably all noticed some of the similarities, but perhaps we haven't all wasted hours of our lives analysing them. So today, we're going to fix that. In this video, I want to take a look at a strange trend that's slowly been taking over television in the past two decades or so. A trend that's basically become its own fully-fledged genre, counting dozens upon dozens of shows that feature remarkably similar tropes, archetypes, structural formulas, all of which I want to delve into today, and get to the bottom of what this genre really is, and how it came about. I've named this genre The Criminal Consultant Show, and perhaps I should start off by explaining what exactly it is I mean by this. The Criminal Consultant Shows are fairly standard crime procedurals, which is to say a show where every episode comes with a new crime to elucidate, and we follow our team of police officers, FBI agents, forensic scientists, NCIS agents, or whatever they may be, as they go through the step-by-step -step process of solving the murder, with maybe a little character drama thrown in the mix, but not too much as to ruin the status quo of the show. But the key difference between your average crime procedural like Law & Order, CSI, NCIS, and what I call the criminal consultant show is, you guessed it, the consultant. The standout feature of these shows is the singular protagonist, who appears as a much stronger main attraction than what you would usually get from your main characters in a typical procedural. In the criminal consultant genre, this protagonist is the entire reason you're watching the show. Obviously not all of these shows literally feature one character who's a consultant, sometimes like in the case of Bones for example, the main character already worked for the FBI, but negotiates her way into having a more active role in the investigation. So she's still doing something that someone with her job wouldn't normally be doing, so it's kind of like she's consulting in a way. But the point being that these shows feature one character who has some kind of eccentricity or ability that they use to solve crimes, and are usually contrasted with a partner or team that are sceptical of the ability, or at the very least aren't exactly sure how to deal with it. And this special ability is the selling point of the show. It's the one thing that differentiates it from any other crime procedural show on television. It's how the show was pitched to network executives, and it's how the show is pitched to you on television. This is what defines this genre. It's that these shows, unlike those other procedurals I mentioned, have one singular point of individuality one touch of creativity that separates them from the rest. This is probably a good point in the video to explain why I'm even making a video about this topic in the first place. After all, isn't this so-called genre just a lazy formula? Is there really anything that interesting to be said about it? Well, yeah. These shows generally are just lazy, formulaic products. But to me, that doesn't necessarily make them less interesting. In a sense, it makes them more interesting. Not necessarily the shows themselves, but the reason for their existence. It's easy to dismiss a genre like this, or superhero movies, or trashy young adult fiction, as being the lowest common denominator entertainment of their respective mediums. But I think it's more interesting to ponder how these genres and trends became popular and why. If so many people like these shows, they must be doing something right. There has to be something more going on underneath the surface here. Something to do with the intrinsic qualities of these genres. Something these works specifically tap into. And one way to answer these questions is to take a look at the history of the genre, to see how it came into existence. The one character who many of these consultants are modelled after is, of course, Sherlock Holmes a character who even refers to himself as a consulting detective. And Sherlock himself was heavily inspired by Edgar Allan Poe's character, Auguste Dupin, who made his first appearance in the short story The Murders of the Rue Morgue, generally considered to be the first detective story. The main points of comparison between these two characters is their signature mix of rational deduction and creative imagination, traits that were passed down to many of the consultants we'll find in these shows. I mean, most of these shows are just variations of the Sherlock premise, whether it's a detective with OCD, a mentalist, a guy who's really good at lie detecting, a guy pretending to be a psychic. Most of these characters' abilities just boil down to really good observational skills. They're just Sherlock's in different packaging. 
But the criminal consultant genre also finds its DNA in places other than just Sherlock and the network crime procedural. In 1985 came along a little show called Moonlighting, which, although today most of you probably haven't even heard of it, was quite popular in its day. And Moonlighting starred a not-quite-bald Bruce Willis and Sybil Shepard as odd couple private detectives. And Moonlighting stood out for its blend of comedy and drama, and its will-they-won't-they dynamic between Bruce Willis and Sybil Shepard. And it's precisely these elements that would be passed down to many of the shows I'll be talking about in this video. Although there is a fair share of darker, grittier criminal consultant series, the somewhat comedic tone is often a staple in these shows, especially those with a more ridiculous, or at least less self-serious setup, like Monk, for example, where our consultant's special ability is OCD, or Psych, where our main character pretends to be a psychic. And the will-they-won't-they they dynamic fits perfectly with the ideological conflict that's at the heart of most of these shows. The protagonist's methods must be put into question, so it follows naturally that the partner be the one to do that, to create some tension between the two main characters. And so, why not add some sexual tension to that as well? This is a trope we find in quite a few of these shows, like Castle, Bones, and Lucifer. Talking of Lucifer, that show is kind of my go-to example of how ridiculous this genre can get, as it's a series about the devil working as a consultant for the LAPD, because he's actually just a nice guy. But despite how crazy these shows' premises can get, the core archetypes and tropes have pretty much remained the same throughout this trend's history, and it's in these archetypes that we really find the meat of this formula. What makes this genre what it is? Okay, so let's start with the protagonists. Within the will-they-won't-they they formula, the most common archetypes are the charismatic, egotistical guy, and the beautiful but no-bullshit female partner. Something we find in, again, Lucifer, but also The Mentalist, Castle, Psych, and a little show you probably haven't heard of called Deception. And Deception might be my favourite of the ridiculous criminal consultant shows, as it's about a superstar magician who joins the FBI as a consultant illusionist. Another popular setup is what I'll call the odd couple or the buddy cop formula. This, of course, generally works the same way the will-they-won't-they they setup does, but without the romantic undertones. Well, not always. Two opposing personalities who are forced to get along despite their differences to solve crimes. The consultant is usually the wisecracking charismatic one, while his partner is the more conventional one. A good example of this is White Collar, where a notorious conman starts working with the FBI after he's captured. Now let's talk specifically about our main characters, and the different types of consultants we find in these shows. I've organised these characters into two main categories the egotist, and the neurotic. The egotist is the consultant who's kind of full of himself, is witty, charming, usually a bit of a womanizer, very confident. We've already mentioned quite a few characters who fit into this archetype. The neurotic, on the other hand, is the character who is in many ways the opposite. Not good with social interactions, kind of awkward, and their ability is usually more of an affliction than it is a cool party trick like it is for the egotists. Most of these characters lean towards more autistic characteristics, like Monk or Brennan from Bones, or Daniel Pierce from the show Perception, which is about an eccentric neuropsychiatrist who helps the FBI solve crimes using his special power, schizophrenia. But of course, the quintessential neurotic consultant is Sherlock who has himself been given the criminal consultant procedural treatment in the show Elementary. And the thematic throughline of the criminal consultant shows featuring a neurotic type consultant will often be about the protagonist learning to be more human, or normal, and overcoming their neuroses and social awkwardness to build healthy relationships, whereas the arcs of the charismatic consultants are generally just about them becoming less of an arsehole. But of course, character archetypes and partner dynamics aren't the only things these shows have in common. As with most network shows, perhaps the most important part of the formula is the structure. And it's in the pilot episodes of these shows where that formulaic structure really becomes apparent. The pilot episode is the proof of concept, not just for the network and the producers, 
but for the characters themselves. The first episode will prove the efficiency of the collaboration between the main characters and give incentive to keep it going. There are a handful of plot points that pop up in most of these show's pilots that tell us a lot about what the writers are really thinking about when developing these shows, what thematic throughlines can be found in basically all of these stories, and what narrative devices these writers rely on. The first is obviously the introduction scene. This is usually where we get to know our main character and their daily routine, and of course this is generally a good opportunity to show off the protagonist's ability in some kind of small feat. The opening scene of Monk does a perfect job of introducing our main character, his ally, his situation, and how his OCD might be problematic for his work. The stove. Over here. It's in the kitchen. No, I mean my stove. I, I think I left it on. It's okay. I uh, checked it as we were leaving. Are you sure? Did you turn the knob? Yeah. The little knob, though. I turned all the knobs. He's at a crime scene, and he keeps getting interrupted by OCD urges, and his nurse tries to keep him on track because she's afraid he won't be of use to the police department if he keeps getting distracted, and then he'll lose his job which establishes the dramatic stakes of his situation. This opening scene shows Monk's OCD as a negative, so it's more satisfying and surprising later on when we see how his disorder can be used effectively during an investigation. The next step in the formula is the encounter, where our protagonist meets the character who will soon become their partner. The first encounter generally makes their differences in personalities or ideologies explicit exposing to us what the source of conflict between these two characters will be and what they will need to overcome. Mr. Castle, you've got quite a rap sheet for a best-selling author. Disorderly conduct, uh, resisting arrest. Boys will be boys. Mr. Castle, this whole bad boy charm thing that you've got going might work for bin bets and celebutantes. Me? I work for a living, so that makes you one of two things in my world. Either the guy who makes my life easier, or the guy who makes my life harder. And trust me, you do not want to be the guy who makes my life harder. Okay. After this comes the getting to know you phase. This can be the beginning of the investigation where our two leads start spending time together. For example, you're the expert on Felix Ruiz. How'd that happen? It's my job. Why aren't you the magic expert? I was born into it. My dad was the great Sebastian Black. Me and Johnny were his grand finale, the disappearing boy. Nobody knew there was two of you. It was our secret. That sounds lonely. No, it wasn't. It was fun. A classic scene that often occurs during the early stages of the investigation is the demonstration of the consultant's ability on an unlikable character. A good way of getting the viewer to like the protagonist is to have them use their ability to humiliate an unlikable character. This is generally used for comedic purposes and as a small demonstration of the power. Okay, I indulged the mayor's office in letting you talk to the kid, but now you're just making wild guesses that have no basis in hard evidence. This was no accident. And personally, I think what you do is a joke. You know, a moment ago, I saw you smile at your colleague, flash her a glance, then shift your gaze. She responded by raising her chin boss, revealing deep embarrassment. Cal? I'll take another wild guess. You two had a fling. She doesn't want to repeat performance because, you know, what with your wife and all. But you won't move on. Oh, no, no. Keep your fingers off your nose. Men have erectile tissue there. Itches when they're hiding something. You know, I don't know a lot about mathematics, but this doesn't make any sense to me. It makes more sense than this. You can't win if you don't buy a ticket. Yes, this is truth. However, the odds of this one being the winning ticket are one in 41 million, which means if you bought 20 tickets every week, you would win the jackpot once every 40,000 years. Really? Yep. It's basic probability theory. Clear? Um, you're claiming to be a psychic, Mr. Spencer. Uh, how else would I know that you two are sleeping together? 
three. Something else that commonly occurs in the pilot is the establishing of the overarching plotline. Not all of these shows necessarily have an overarching story, but those that do will generally want to intertwine that thread with the first episode's mystery. This is done fairly well in the Mentalist pilot, where we get flashbacks on Patrick Jane's origin story littered throughout the episode. The overarching storyline will often be the very reason the protagonist becomes a consultant in the first place, like in Deception, where the magician's brother is framed for a woman's death. The person who framed his brother is the main villain of the series. She wasn't the woman from the car. This body was a different woman. Her eyes, they were the same color. That's why I ran. I knew it wasn't an accident. I was set up. Who could do that? We could. It's just a classic misdirection into a body swap. You're saying an illusionist set you up. Man, he's calling me out. Who? The illusionist who did all this. I'll bet everything I've got, the guy who made your plane disappear framed my brother for murder. All that matters is, you're looking for a drug dealer, I'm looking for the magician who helped him get away. Of course, another plot point that can be found in most of these pilots is the second act low point which is often the main conflict between our two leads. This is the moment where the characters think, maybe this won't work out. It can either be an instance of the consultant's ability not working, or an argument between the two main characters. You were visiting the grave of the man that you let die on your operating table. It's so incredible, the way that you can solve people just by looking at them. I noticed you don't have any mirrors around here. And what's that supposed to mean? It means I think you know a lost cause when you see one. Tomorrow I'll arrange for a new companion. But tonight I've got plans. But at the end of the episode, we of course get the climax. The final demonstration of the consultant's ability, where it finally pays off. Call the illusion of choice. The garage, the SUV, left, right, left. I think you got all these choices, but really, you don't. Because they all lead to the same place. And a single choice. Give up. While most of these shows obviously emerged out of a desire to create just another police procedural with a twist, fully intent on sticking to this tried and true formula, other shows in this genre feel sort of out of place. Like the writers had an interesting premise for a show, but didn't really know where to go with it, so they just tacked the criminal consultant element onto it. Limitless is one of these shows. Being a TV sequel to the 2011 film of the same name, about a guy who unlocks the full potential of his brain using a mysterious drug. The idea here was, I guess, to just capitalise on the mild success of the movie, but that probably didn't really work out seeing as it was cancelled after one season. The show Forever kind of falls into this basket as well. A show about an immortal man who's been alive for over 200 years and works as a New York City medical examiner. And because of his long life and experience, he's gained tremendous observational skills that, of course, can be put to good use solving crimes. In both of these shows, there's an okay premise that could have made for a somewhat interesting serialized drama with a sci-fi or fantasy-based mystery at its center. But you can't just make a show like that. You can't just come up with an original idea. That's too risky. So what you do is you take the formula and you slap a single new element onto it. But in shows like these, the crime procedural element just gets in the way of what could have potentially been an interesting premise. And then there are shows where the premise just doesn't really work. Like in Numbers, which tells the story of a young genius mathematician who uses mathematical models to help his FBI agent brother solve crimes. But the issue here is that the premise doesn't really work. To give you an example, this is the idea our main character comes up with in the first episode. Check this out. You see the sprinkler? Yeah? Yeah, okay. I see the sprinkler. Mm. You see the drops? Yeah, I see the drops. Even using math, there's no practical way to predict where the next water drop will land. Okay. There's too many variables. However, say I couldn't see the sprinkler. From the pattern of the drops, I could calculate its precise location.
It's not about predicting the next site. It's finding what the sites have in common, the point of origin. So this guy, who's a mathematical genius, comes up with the brilliant idea of trying not to predict where the serial killer will strike next, but where he lives, based on where the previous killings took place. And the detectives are like... ...about us a completely new way of identifying a perpetrator. Exactly. Not who he is, but where he is. The question is, will it be accurate and identify a small enough area? Good morning, Thomas. You think Charlie can do it? I mean, he can be a pain in the ass, but he is a world-class mathematician. If it works, we have a whole new system for analyzing and investigating serial crime. What the fuck are you talking about? Is this really not something you guys had thought of? What were you doing before? The police don't try to magically predict who's gonna get murdered next. If 10 murders happen in the same area, the first thing they're gonna do is look for criminals in that area. So the issue here is that applying mathematics to crime solving just doesn't really fit. A human lie detector, a mentalist, a medium, a guy who writes crime novels, a guy who can use 100% of his brain, all of these, as ridiculous as some of them might be, make sense as aids to a criminal investigation. Their abilities are connected to crime solving in some obvious way. That's not the case for a guy who's really good at maths, because detective work isn't a hard science. When you're investigating a murder, a solid foundation in logic will obviously help you, but you don't really have enough information or data for hard mathematics to be of any real help. Okay, so now that we've looked at the ins and outs of the criminal consultant genre, let's get to answering the big question. Beyond the fact that most of these shows follow a simplistic, tried and true formula that's appealing to producers because of the minimal risk involved, why is this formula so appealing to so many people in the first place? I think the answer lies in the fact that at the heart of all of these shows, we find a conflict, which is the conflict between individuality and conformity. Most of these archetypes, plot points, and tropes I've discussed contribute to this central thematic tension in some way. The partner who represents an opposing philosophy, the unconventional methods, the conflict with authority, it's always there. Now, let's put our critical theory hats on for a minute and think about what might be going on underneath the surface for the viewers of these shows. Thematically, the setup for these shows allow the viewer to identify with a character who is separate from the establishment and is generally a chaotic agent who the forces of order dislike, while at the same time working with them to enforce order. An example of this idea taken to the extreme is something like White Collar or The Blacklist, where an actual FBI's most wanted criminal starts working with the FBI. These are shows where the consultant isn't just an unconventional, chaotic entity that clashes with the establishment, they are representatives of the opposing side, the enemies of order. And sometimes writers choose to use this genre to actually dig deep into the problematic nature of their maverick protagonists. The crime procedural cracker, for example, which is somewhat of a British precursor to the criminal consultant genre, repeatedly delves into the problematic nature of its main character. Three grand, shepherd's hair. Do you know you stopped masticating for a wee second there? You are. There's something a bit macho about a bit like that, don't you think? A wee bit like slapping a certain part of your anatomy on the counter and saying, look how big it is, everybody, look how big it is. You are. And then there's a show like Hannibal, where the familiar setup of a character who can think like a serial killer is taken to its logical thematic conclusion. It becomes a sort of Jungian story about Will's relationship with the shadow, the dark side of human morality. It's a story about that tug of war with his inner demons, which are externally represented by his relationship with Hannibal. And each season of the show depicts a new step in that relationship. But what all of these shows have in common is a protagonist who clashes with the system in some way, but who also inevitably ends up cooperating with it and adjusting to it. It's the marriage of individuality and conformity. We all like to think that we're special, that we're different, that we stand out in some way. 
But the truth is that most of us do lead normal lives, where we blend into the establishment. We become a part of the system. So these shows appeal to that side of us that likes to think, yeah, sure, I'm part of the system, and I'm contributing to and enforcing its ideals, but I'm not like the other guys. I'm special. <laughs>